Let me ask you the big question uh, for young people uh, listening to this today in high school and college. What advice would you give them in terms of uh, which career path to take and um, maybe just about life in general? Well, in my case, um, I didn't start life with any kind of goals. I was when I was going to college, it's like, oh, what did I study? Well, maybe I'll do this electrical engineering stuff, you know. Um, it wasn't like, you know, today you see some of these young kids are so motivated, like I'll change the world. I was like, yeah. blah, 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 you know, <laughs> whatever. And um, but then I did fall in love with something hmm. besides my wife. But I fell in love with this, like, oh my God, it would be so cool to understand how the brain works. And then I I said to myself, that's the most important thing I could work on. I, I can't imagine anything more important because if we understand how the brains work, we could build tells of machines and they could figure out all the other big questions of the world, right? So, and then I said, but I want to understand how I work. So I fell in love with this idea and I became passionate about it. And uh, this is, you know, a trope, people say this, but it was it's true. Because I was passionate about it, I was able to put up with almost so much crap. You know, <laughs> you know, I was, yeah. I was in that, you know, I was like, person said you can't do this i was i was a graduate student at berkeley when they said you can't study this problem you know no one's can solve this or you can't get funded for it you know then i went to do you know mobile computing and it was like people say you can't do that you can't build a cell phone (laughs) you know so but all along i kept being motivated because i wanted to work on this problem i said i want to understand the brain works and if i got myself you know i got one lifetime i'm going to figure it out do the best i can so by having that because, you know, these it's really, as you point out, Lex, it's really hard to do these things. People, it's just, it, there's so many downers along the way. So many way, obstacles that get in your way. Yeah, we, I'm sitting here happy all the time, but trust me, it's not always like that. Well, that's, I guess, the the happiness, the, the, the passion is a prerequisite for surviving the whole Yeah, the whole I think thing. so. I think that's right. Um, and so I, it's, I don't want to sit to someone and say, you know, you need to find a passion and do it. No, maybe you don't. But if you do find something you're passionate about, then, then you can follow it as far as your passion will let you put up with it. Do you remember how you found it? This is how the spark happened. In, why speak? specifically for me? Yeah, like because you said it's yeah. such an interesting. So, like almost like later in life. By later, I mean like not in, when you were five. Fine. Yeah, you you didn't really know, and then all of a sudden you fell in love with yeah, that. Yeah, idea. yeah. I there was there was there was two separate events that compounded one another. One. When I was probably a teenager, it might have been 17 or 18, I made a list of the most interesting problems I th- could think of. First was, why does the universe exist? Seems like not existing is more likely. Yeah. The second one was, well, given it exists, why does it behave the way it does? You know, it's laws of physics. Why is it equal MC squared, not MC cubed? You know, that's an mm. interesting question. I don't know. <laughs> Third one was, like, what's the origin of life? Um, and the, th- the fourth one was, what's intelligence? And I stopped there. I said, well, that's probably the most interesting one. Mm -hmm. And I put that aside um, as a teenager. But then when I was 22 and I was reading the, um, no, it was, excuse me, I was 70, it was 1979, excuse me, 1979. I was reading, uh, so I was, at that time I was 22. uh, I was reading uh, the September issue of Scientific American, which is all about the brain. And then the final essay was by Francis Crick, who of DNA fame. And he had taken his interest to studying the brain now. And he said, you know, there's something wrong here. He says, we got all this data, all this fact. This is 1979. All these facts about the brain. Tons and tons of facts about the brain. Do we need more facts? Or do we just need to think about a way of rearranging the facts we have? Maybe we're just not thinking about the problem correctly. Yeah. You know, because he says, this shouldn't, be, <laughs> this shouldn't be like this, you know? So I read that and I said, wow. I said, I don't have to become like an experimental neuroscientist. I could just t- look at all those facts and try to f- and become a theoretician and try to figure it out. And I said that I felt like it was something I would be good at. I said I wouldn't be a good experimentalist. I don't have the patience for it. But I'm, I'm a good thinker and I love puzzles. And this is like the biggest puzzle in the world. It's the biggest puzzle of all time. And I got all the puzzle pieces in front of me. Damn, that was exciting. And there's something. Obviously, you can't convert it to words that it just kind of sparked this passion. I mean, I have that a few times in my life, just something, um, yeah, just just like you, uh, it grabs you. Yeah, I felt it was something that was both important and that I could make a contribution to. Yeah, and so all of a sudden, it felt like, oh, it gave me purpose in life. Yeah, 
you know? I honestly don't think it has to be as big as one of those four questions. It, no, no. I but think I, you, you can find those things in, in the smallest. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I'm with uh, the, the David Foster Wallace said, like, the key to life is to be unborable. I'm, I, think, I think it's very possible to find that intensity oh, of joy in the smallest absolutely. thing. Absolutely. I'm just, you asked me my story. Yeah, yeah. So, no, so. but it, I'm actually speaking to the audience. Yeah. It doesn't have to be those four. You happen to get excited by one of the bigger questions of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the universe, but uh, but the, even the smallest things. And no, watching absolutely. the Olympics now, oh, just yeah. uh, just giving yourself life, uh, giving your life over to the study and the mastery of a particular sport is fascinating. Yeah. And and uh, if if it sparks joy and passion, you're able to, in the case of the Olympics, basically suffer for like a couple yeah. of decades to achieve. I mean, you can find joy and passion just being a parent. I mean, it's- Yeah, yeah the, the parenting one is funny. So I, I was, uh, not always, but for a long time, wanted kids and get married and stuff. And especially that has to do with the fact that I've seen a lot of people that I respect get a whole nother level of joy from kids. And, at, you know, at first is like, you're thinking is, well, like I don't have enough time in the day, right? If, if I have this passion <laughs> to true. solve- Which is true. Yeah, yes. But like, if I want to solve intelligence, how is this kid's situation going to help me? But then you, you realize that, uh, you know, like you said, the things that sparks joy, and it's very possible that kids could provide even a greater or deeper or more meaningful joy than those bigger questions yeah when they they enrich each other and that that seemed like a obviously when i was younger it's probably a counterintuitive notion because there's only so many hours in the day but then life is finite and you have to pick the things that give give you joy yeah uh, but you can also you understand you you can be patient too i mean it's finite but we do have, you know, whatever, 50 years or something. But it's also long, yeah. <laughs> so so in my case, you know, in my case, I had to give up on my dream of the neuroscience because I, I was a graduate student at Berkeley and they told me I couldn't do this and I couldn't get funded. And, you know, and and so I went back in and went back in the computing industry for a number of years. Uh, I thought it would be four, but it turned out to be more. But I said, but I said, I'll come back. You know, I definitely I'm definitely gonna come back. I know I'm gonna do this computer stuff for a while, but I'm definitely coming back. Everyone knows that. And it's the same as like raising kids. Well, yeah, you still you have to spend a lot of time with your kids. It's fun, enjoyable, um, but that doesn't mean you have to give up on other dreams. It just means that you may have to wait a week or two <laughs> to, to work on that next idea. <laughs> well, you, you, you talked about the 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 darker side of me, disappointing sides of human nature that we're uh, hoping to overcome so that we don't destroy ourselves. I tend to put a lot of value in um, the broad general concept of love of uh, the human capacity to, um, of compassion towards each other, of just kindness, whatever that longing of the, just the human, human to human connection. Yeah. It connects back to our in initial discussion. I tend to see a lot of value in this collective intelligence aspect. Yeah. I think some of the magic of human civilization happens when there's, uh, a party is not as fun when it, you're alone. Yeah, no. No, I bottle. totally agree with you on these issues. Uh, uh, do you think, from a neocortex perspective, do you, uh, what role does love play in the human condition? Uh, well, those are two separate things. From a neocortex <laughs> point of view, I don't think it, it doesn't impact our thinking about human uh, about the neocortex. From a human condition point of view, I think it's core. Um, I mean, we get so much pleasure out of loving people and helping people. Um, so you know, I can I, I'll rack it up to old brain stuff, and maybe we can throw it under the the bus of evolution, if you want, um, mm. uh, that's fine. Um, uh, it doesn't impact how I think about how we model the world. Um, but from a humanity point of view, I think it's essential. Well, I, I tend to give it to the new brain. And also I tend to think that some of aspects of that need to be engineered into AI systems, uh, mm. both in their ability to have compassion for other humans and their ability to maximize love in the world between mm -hmm. humans. So I'm more thinking about the uh, social network. So like yeah. when, whenever there's a deep integration between AI systems and humans, yeah. so specific applications where yeah. it's uh, AI and humans, I think that's something that's often not talked about in terms of um, metrics over which you 
try to maximize, yeah. uh, like which metric to maximize in a system. It seems like one of the most powerful things in societies is the capacity to love. Well, it's fascinating. I, I think it's it's a great way of thinking about it. You know, I have I have been thinking more of these fundamental mechanisms in the brain yes. as opposed to the social interaction between or the interaction between humans and AI systems in the future, which is. And I think if you think about that, you're absolutely right. Um, but that's that's a complex system. I can have intelligent systems that don't have that component, but they're not interacting with people. You know, they're just running something or building a building someplace or something. I don't know. Um, but if you think about interacting with humans, yeah, it's it's gonna. And then, but it has to be engineered in there. I don't think it's gonna appear on its own. Uh, that's a good question. I, yeah. Well, we could. We'll look there, but in terms of. Uh, uh, from a reinforcement learning perspective, whether the darker sides of human nature or the better angels of our nature uh, win out, yeah. statistically speaking, I don't know. I tend to be optimistic <laughs> and hope that love wins out in the end. Um, you've done a lot of incredible stuff uh, and your book is uh, driving towards this fourth question that you started with uh, on the nature of intelligence. What do you hope your legacy for people reading a hundred years from now? Um, How do you hope they remember your work? How do you hope they remember this book? Well, I think as an entrepreneur or a scientist or any human who's trying to accomplish some things, I have a view that really all you can do is accelerate the inevitable. <laughs> um, yeah. It's like, you know, if we didn't figure out, if we didn't study the brain, someone else would study the brain. Yeah. If, you know, if Elon just did, didn't make electric cars, someone else would do it eventually. And if, you know, if Thomas Edison didn't invent a light bulb, we wouldn't be using candles today. Mm -hmm. So what, what you can do as an individual is you can accelerate something that's beneficial and make it happen sooner than would have. That's, that's really it. That's all you can do. Um, you can't create a new reality that it wasn't going to happen. Um, so from that perspective, um, I would hope that our work, not just me, but our work in general, um, people would look back and said, hey, they really helped make this better future happen sooner. Um, <laughs> they, you know, they helped us understand the nature of false beliefs sooner than we might have. They made it, now we're, we're so happy that we have these intelligent machines doing these things, helping us that, that maybe that solved the climate change problem and they made it happen sooner. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the best I would hope for. Some would say those guys just, move the needle forward a little bit in time <laughs> well it, i do it, it feels like the progress of human civilization is not is uh there's a lot of trajectories and if you have individuals that accelerate towards one direction that helps steer human civilization so i think in the long stretch of time all all trajectories will be traveled, but I think it's nice for this particular civilization on Earth to travel down one that's not. Yeah, well, I think you're right. I mean, look, we have the, the take the whole period of you know World War II Nazism or something like that. Well, that was a bad sidestep, right? <laughs> we went over there for a while, but you know there is the optimistic view about life that um, that ultimately it, it does converge in, in a positive way. It progresses ultimately, even if we have years of darkness. Um, so, yeah. So I think you can perhaps. That's accelerating the positive. It could also mean eliminating some bad missteps along the way too. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I, I'm, I'm an optimistic in that way. I, I, I thought, you know, despite we talked about the end of civilization, you know, I, I think we're going to live for a long time. I hope we are. Um, I think our society in the future is going to be better. We're going to have less discord. We're going to have less people killing each other. You know, we'll solve. You know, we'll make the we'll live in some sort of way that's compatible with the carrying capacity of the earth. Um, I'm optimistic these things will happen. Uh, and all we can do is try to get there sooner. And at the very least, if we do destroy ourselves, we'll have a few satellites <laughs> orbiting yeah. uh, that will uh, uh, that will tell alien civilization that we were once, or maybe here. our future, you know, future inhabitants of Earth. You know, imagine we, you know, the, <laughs> the planet of the apes scenario. You know, we kill ourselves, in a, you know, million years from now or a billion years from now. There's another species on the planet. These curious going. creatures were once here. Yeah, um, Jeff, thank you so much for your work and. Um, Thank you so much for talking to me once again. Well, actually, it's great. I love what you do. I love your podcast. You have the most interesting people, me aside. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's a real service I think you do for, uh, in a very broader sense for humanity, I think. Thanks, Jeff. 
All right. Pleasure.